I asked Brother Barry to read this passage, these two sets of verses from Matthew chapter 10, because today I would like for us to close out our year-long study on discipleship. This year we have been em emphasizing becoming a disciple. We've been talking about this passage here from Romans 10 about how a disciple is not above his teacher, a slave is not greater than his master. Jesus says there in verse 25, it is enough for him to become like his master. We've looked at, I've mentioned several different times, how the Bible uses the word or some form of the word disciple 200 72 times, it's translated in the New American Standard, uses some word, form of the word Christian three times. They both refer to the same people, but we use the word Christian, or at least in my experience, have used the word Christian much more frequently than the word disciple. And so one of the things that I have tried to do in these series of studies is to help us remember the truths carried in the term disciple and to learn to see ourselves in the context of a disciple and to remember that we are called not just to wear his name but to live his way not just to carry his name but to carry his habits and his mode of life and that's what a disciple does it is enough for a disciple to be like his master. I've been preaching here at Mountain Creek regularly for eight and a half years. I've been ministering here in one form or another for twelve and a half years. And I want you to know that my ambition for you, my ambition for the people who gather here as a part of this family, is for you to become more like Jesus. And for you and for me to become more like Jesus is discipleship. The only way that we will be more like Jesus is if we become disciples and discipline ourselves or allow him to discipline us and turn us into people more like him. And that's what he wants us to be. And so that's what we've been talking about this year. And what I want to do today is I want to review the different habits or the different tools that God has given to us and exemplified for us in Scripture to help us give ourselves to him. And in giving ourselves to him, he makes us more like Jesus, more like what he wants us to be. So I want to review the different disciplines or the different habits that are pictured in Scripture. The first one that we talked about was prayer. And I know, I hope that this stuck in your mind. Luke 5, 16, I'm going to mention in a few minutes, Lord willing, about another one of the disciplines. But Luke 5, 16 says, But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Jesus is God incarnate, was God incarnate. He is God, and he is God who took human form. But while he was in human form, over and over, time after time, habitually, he went off by himself to pray. And if Jesus needed to pray, you need to pray. Amen. There is no other conclusion that can be drawn. If God in the flesh needs to pray to the Father and to keep himself while he lives in a fleshly body aligned with the Father, so do you. It is absolutely fundamental to becoming what God wants you to be, to allowing God to change you into what God wants you to be. 
It needs to be private. It needs to be secluded. Not just public prayer. Not just prayer before the meal. But real, deep, mental, spiritual submission to God in word. It will change your life. Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus taught us, But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we're instructed, Pray without ceasing. Several times people have come to me and they have asked me, What can I do to become... To get over some of these hurdles that I'm having. What can I do to be more spiritual? And I don't know if I'm right, but I'm of the firm opinion that the place you must start is prayer. For me personally, prayer is the strongest factor in bringing the rest of my mind and the rest of my life into submission to God. Plus, He then blesses me and gives me what I ask for or changes what I want, mostly through prayer. The second thing we talked about was study. I think prayer and study are the two essential <coughs> disciplines that every Christian must have and cannot be sacrificed. Without prayer and study, you cannot be a disciple. With prayer, you submit yourself and you humble yourself and you rely on God. With study, you learn what God wants. You learn what God wants you to be, and you allow his thoughts and his ideas to become your thoughts and your ideas, and allow his thoughts and his ideas to change who you are, to change how you think, to change what you want. You combine that with prayer, and it begins transforming. Jesus, Luke 4, 16, says he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, Jesus' custom, Jesus' practice, his habit, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Jesus' custom was to read the Word, was to study the Word of God. Even though he's the author of salvation, he studied the Word of God and read First Timothy 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, we're instructed, be diligent to prove, to show yourself, I'm sorry, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. King James translates that same verse, study to show thyself approved. You've got to know what God's Word says. A lot of people think that they are led by God. A lot of people think that God tells them what to do. A lot of people think that God has shown them what He wants in their lives. But I'm telling you right now that God doesn't show anybody today what He wants in their lives unless there's a huge dose of Scripture poured into it. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't use your conscience. I'm not saying He doesn't use your ideas and your opportunities to help you find the right way, but he never does it without his word being the major factor in your decision-making process. Never. And you will never know God's will until you study God's word. There are a lot of people who think that they know God's will, but they never study God's word. And they make mistake after mistake after mistake because they haven't been changed into a person who thinks God's thoughts. Jesus said, blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. You want to purify your mind? you got to put the truth in it. Study is absolutely fundamental. Thirdly, we talked about meditation. Meditation, similar to prayer, similar to study, useless without the two of them, in my opinion. But with prayer and study, meditation is sitting down and taking the word of God, taking the blessings that God has put into your life, combining God's word with your life, thinking about it for a long, deep time. 
what God's word means in the context of where you are. Notice all the ways that God has already blessed you. Notice the opportunities that God has given to you. Think about what God's word says and how it applies to where you are. Jesus told the parable of the unclean spirit, Luke 11. Verse 24, he said, When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. The last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Cleaning your life up, getting rid of the stuff that bring you down, getting rid of the things that pull you away from God is useful. But it's only good if you replace it and you intertwine your life with God's word and God's will. And meditation helps you take God's word and intertwine it and sow it through all the different aspects of where you live and how you live. And that's the purpose of meditation, to fill yourself up so that when those temptations return, they find you clothed to eat. Fourthly, we talked about fasting. The first three that we talked about are very much on the inside of your body. Prayer, study, meditation, it's very much in your mind. Fasting is where you start taking the things in your mind, the spiritual activities in your mind, and bringing them out to the outside of your body. Fasting, the purpose of fasting, is to take the, the physical and submit them to the spiritual. Romans teaches us that there is a war between the spirit and the flesh. Fasting is about making the spirit in control of the flesh and putting the most basic of fleshly need, food, under the dominion of your spiritual will for a spiritual purpose to draw closer to God and to train your body to bend to God's spirit, to bend to your commitment to God's way of doing things. Jesus fasted. Matthew 4 tells us that after his baptism, he went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He expects us to fast. Matthew 6, verse 17, Jesus said, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that by your fasting you will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus expects us to fast. He expects us to teach our bodies to bend our physical desires to the control of our spiritual commitment to God. If it doesn't have a spiritual purpose, if it's not accompanied with prayer and study, it's not very valuable. But if you take fasting and you combine it with prayer and study, it makes the effect of the prayer and study quicker in effect and bigger and stronger in effect. And helps you bring those desires that bring you temptation under control. It's God's will for all of us. Another thing that's very similar to that is the fifth one we talked about, which is solitude. Getting off by yourself. Getting away from the distractions of life. Being able to spend uninterrupted, undistracted time without the television, without the radio, without the phone, without the computer. In time with God. To give you time for prayer, time for study, time for meditation. Luke 5, 16, I told you, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Jesus wanted to be by himself. People who are growing closer to God and who are combining God's thoughts and God's ideas and replacing them with their own and combining them with their lives need silence. They need to be by themselves in spiritual endeavors. It's hard to find. Hard to do. But a valuable thing. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. 
says, My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. Spending time by yourself contemplating God's role in your life. Strengthens your faith. Practices trusting God. So that when you're in a difficult situation and you don't feel in control of your time and in your position, you're accustomed to relying on God. In silence. My soul waits in silence for God only. After that, we talked about simplicity. We talked about living simply. Living simply means de-emphasizing possessions, de-emphasizing things, de-emphasizing the importance of all of the clutter that we gather to ourselves, all of the gadgets and trinkets and things that we think we have to buy. Living simply. Jesus said, in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Paul said, 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Simplicity is intentionally, purposely saying, I'm going to be content with what God has given me. And not think that I have to have a bunch of things to make me content. And I'm not going to allow all the things that everybody else is chasing after to distract me from being what God wants me to be and giving the time to God that I need to give to God. I'm going to live simply for God and declutter my life, and declutter my mind. Living simply. Next, we talked about service. Luke 22, verse 27, Jesus said, For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Service is about position. Service is about how you see yourself in relation to other people. And how you rank importance. That's what service is about. And what Jesus teaches is for you to rank yourself as least important. Jesus said, I was in heaven. I created the earth. And then I emptied myself and came to earth, not just as a man, but as a servant. And not only that, but I've washed your feet. And not only that, he then went to the cross and shed his blood for you. And so he says and he teaches us, and to be like him we must stop trying to be better than other people. We must stop trying to be ahead or more important than other people. And to do that, we serve other people. We humble ourselves like Jesus did. And we bow down before other people like Jesus did. And we give of ourselves to other people like Jesus did. You remember the first passage that Barry read, a servant is not greater than his master. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he said, as I have done to you, now you do to others. He's teaching an attitude of service, an attitude of humility and keeping yourself humble by actively using your body to help other people. It helps other people, but it helps you keep yourself humble. I don't know if you remember, but when we talked about that, we pointed out that a lot of people serve for glory. A lot of the service that is done, a lot of the charity work in our society is done for self-promotion and to make you look good, which is the opposite of the kind of service that Jesus teaches. He teaches the service of true humility. 
To serve is not for gain, but to serve is to keep you low. It's about position. Then, in 8, we talked about fellowship. You remember Jesus' prayer in John 17. John 17, verse 20, he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The Bible, the New Testament, emphasizes unity. It emphasizes oneness over and over and over and over. In Jesus' prayer in the upper room, right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to be arrested, he prays for unity. You can't be one if you're never together. Fellowship is not optional. Fellowship is fundamental to discipleship. To be a disciple of Jesus, you have to be with the other disciples. Jesus always had disciples together. He brought them and he called them so that they could be with him. Fellowship, being together, binding yourself together with fellow disciples is indispensable to being a disciple. To encouraging each other, teaching each other, helping each other, correcting each other. Finally, last month, we talked about worship. John 4, verse 23, Jesus said, But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. God is spirit. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship includes the corporate worship that we gather together, that we assemble to engage in. And what we have gathered together for this morning is to worship God together, to declare God's worthiness, to show Him our gratitude and our thanksgiving, and to humble ourselves and to submit ourselves to His worthiness. But worship is also about declaring His greatness and giving Him our thanksgiving for our blessings every day as we have opportunity. Celebrating the blessings. That he has given to us. And in doing that. Doing it habitually. Over and over again. Keeps us. In the proper <coughs> mindset. In the proper position. In the proper posture. Toward God. Recognizing him as the giver. Of all our blessings. And we as unworthy recipients. Recognizing his worthiness. Of our submission. That's worship. And it needs to be done over and over. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. <coughs> you should dedicate yourself and discipline yourself to expressing joy, thanksgiving, praise every time you're aware of a blessing. And if you're aware of many of your blessings, you will be declaring praise Dozens of times a day. Because they are everywhere. I hope you'll remember what Jesus said. Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus, verse 28 to 30. Jesus talks about the weary and the heavy laden. And he says, come to me. I will give you rest. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said it. Therefore, it is true. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. But sometimes doing what he wants, following the will of God, turning the other cheek, getting angry and not sinning, not allowing the sun to go down on our wrath, we find very burdensome. We find it a very heavy yoke. The reason for that is we haven't been practicing. We haven't been practicing pulling that load. We haven't been practicing carrying that burden. Discipleship is about practicing. It's about living the way Jesus did, living the way Jesus instructs us to live, 
even when there's no pressure, even when it's not difficult, so that when it is difficult, it'll be natural. So that when it is difficult, we'll be in the right posture, we'll be in the right place, we'll have the right mindset, because we've been cultivating that posture and that mindset all the time. It is enough for us to be like Jesus. I hope that you'll commit yourself to being like him. To do that, you have to adopt his habits. If you haven't adopted the habits of Jesus, if you haven't submitted yourself to him, humbled yourself before him, sought the forgiveness that he makes available, he's giving you another day. He's given you another opportunity. I don't know when it will be too late. If you haven't come to Christ already, come today. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess that faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. If you need to come to Christ to begin the process of discipleship, if you need to return to Christ and rededicate yourself, Please come down front as we stand and sing.